start doing. All right. Yeah. Good. All right. So, um, uh, sorry about uh, asking you earlier. Um, as I said, I need to leave a little bit early. So um, today we're going to finally start with um, the formalism of uh, quantum field theory, specifically in the operator uh, picture. So I'll first define the interaction picture, which is what one uses in quantum field theory. Um, and then uh, I will describe the uh, weak theorem and the Feynman theorem, which are the basis of the perturbation theory uh, for lambda phi 4 uh, field theory, the operation formalism. And then next lecture, we'll actually start to do perturbation. So today, we'll lay the groundwork, define everything that is needed. Um, all right, so first, I will define for you the interaction picture, but in the context of more general uh, review, or if you didn't have this, well, tell you about quantum mechanical pictures in general. So, um, I guess you all had uh, the Schrodinger, you all had a description of the Schrodinger and Heisenberg pictures, and I, I described them for you anyway. But um, the idea of pictures is more general than that. Uh, the point is, since quantum mechanics is described by states and operators acting on them, um, we can describe uh, we can describe these in uh, various bases. So, if I have a basis of states psi then I can consider a transformation by an operator, by a fixed operator W, and then define a different basis of state. So let's say I then define the transform state psi W as being this W psi. But, but if we do this, that means that the operator itself acting, the operator, so if I have an operator A acting on the states of psi, on the states of psi w, I have a transformed operator psi uh, aw, which is w a w minus 1, right? Which means really that then I have uh, a w psi w is equal to w a psi, right? <coughs> okay. But moreover, if I do this, then I can define also a um, transformed Hamiltonian that defines the time evolution of operators in the new picture. So I'll define H prime as HW, by which I mean the original Hamiltonian. Well, yeah, let me put, I'm not sure why in my notes I put curly one, but let's put like this. So, H prime, the, the new Hamiltonian, so the, the Hamiltonian for time evolution in the W picture is HW, which is the original Hamiltonian transformed by W, but then plus IH bar w dt w dagger okay uh, 
Um, and then that means that the time evolution uh, the time evolution of operators in the new picture is given by the time evolution of the original operator transformed by W, right? But then plus the contribution of this term, right? So the contribution of this term would be the commuta commutation with, uh, with AW. Okay?
because of this relation h prime being zero and h prime you know is this, right? Then we can say that the Hamiltonian is also equal to minus i h bar uh, dw dt w dagger, where the w is the one that takes you between uh, Schrodinger and Heisenberg. Okay. And then moreover, as I said, we want to, to have at t0 to have the pictures to be equal. Right? <clears throat> so then uh, that means that in, in this particular case for Schrodinger to Heisenberg, we have that W of t is nothing but the Schrodinger evolution operator. Well, inverted 1, us minus 1. And inverting the evolution operator means really exchanging the t with t0. OK, so this was the general uh, theory of pictures. But <clears throat> we, were, we now want to apply this to a very specific case. So remember, what we are after is defining perturbation theory. Okay, So we want to define perturbation theory which means that we want to treat interactions as some sort of small perturbations and we want to define the time evolution and everything uh, in terms of a free Hamiltonian without interactions. Okay, So that is the interaction picture. Or Dirac picture. The idea is that we assume that the Hamiltonian can be split in two parts, a free part that's quadratic and an interaction part that's higher order. The free part can be solved exactly and we know how to quantize and so on. But we don't know how to treat the interaction part. So, so then, what uh, what we uh, what we want to consider is uh, something like something like the Heisenberg picture, just that only for H zero, right? We saw that the Heisenberg feature had some advantages. We could write uh, quantization. We, we wrote quantization for the free scalar field in, the, in terms of Heisenberg operators. So that works. We want to write something like the Heisenberg feature, but just for H0. So like Heisenberg, but for H0 only. Okay. So that means that operators must evolve according to the Heisenberg-like law, but with H0. So the time evolution of operators in the interaction picture should be given by the commutator of the interaction picture operator, but only with H0, not with H. But that means that we're left with some time evolution for states as well. So that means that for states in the interaction picture, we have still uh, an interaction. But, uh, oh, sorry, I call this H1. 
sorry. Um, yeah, I. Uh, you, you see now why I called it H1. I mean, it would have been uh, perhaps better to call it HI for interaction, but I called it H1 because here now I have two indices. One tells me H1, so that's the um, nonlinear piece in the Hamiltonian, but the index I. I mean, since this is an operator, that means that this operator is in the interaction picture. Okay? So, the interaction part, and then this says that this is in interaction in picture. Okay? And here I wrote H0 because like we had in here for the, the Heisenberg and Schrodinger uh, Hamiltonian is the same and that means that for H0 this is the same so H0i interaction part is the same as H0 Schrodinger okay <coughs> Okay, so this was about um, pictures and the interaction picture. Do, do you have any questions here for the moment? All right, let's move on then. So, the, so from now on, quantum field theory will, will almost always be in uh, the interaction picture. At least perturbative quantum field theory will be in the interaction picture. Uh, and so we need to understand how to relate this to the Heisenberg picture that, um, that I described last lecture. So the, to the, I should say to the quantization of the Heisenberg picture that I described uh, last uh, lecture. Okay, so let's think about some physical scattering. and the interaction picture. So, <clears throat> so why do we uh, think this is a good idea? Well, you might think of what kind of questions do we need to solve by perturbation theory. Of course, there are things that are not perturbative, and for those we should do other methods, but like, uh, you know, calculating the mass of a proton or something like this in the vacuum. These things are non perturbative and for those we should use other things. But for most things that we're interested in particle physics, and not only, I mean, also in condensed matter, you are um, interested in a, in a situation where there's some asymptotics. So let's say you talk about uh, collisions at CERN, right? Then certainly far away from the collision point where the particles are created, they are approximately free. The particles are kind of non-interacting. I mean, there's a bunch of them, but they're well separated. Uh, so to first approximation, we can think of them as being evolved with just H0, the free part of some Hamiltonian, right? So asymptotically, <coughs> in space and time, we, can see we have three particles. So the time evolution is defined by a zero. Okay. All right, so that's certainly one uh, thing we should keep in mind, that we have an asymptotic region of space and time where the particles are free and they are evolved by some H0. But there's still one more hitch. <laughs> the thing is, 
if we want to quantize things, so that's the idea. If the particles are free, then the point is we should be able to quantize them according to H0, to the, to the free Hamiltonian, and that's we know how to do. We did it uh, last time. Um, but uh, but um, the question is then, so for, for H0, there's a vacuum state without particles that we defined, we wrote as zero, which was assumed to be the product of the zeros in the Fox space, right? And these were the ones that were annihilated by, by the annihilation operators. Okay. On the other hand, for H, we have a total vacuum state that I will call omega that is certainly different than zero. Okay. So, the first uh, question is how do you relate things asymptotically you're supposed to have uh, asymptotic states that are in the vacuum or perturbations around the vacuum. So you have to describe something about omega in terms of something about zero. Okay? So that's what we'll do. And this will be the Feynman theorem. We'll do it shortly. Okay, but the second question then is what kind of uh, what kind of uh, quantities do we need to calculate such that we can compute scatterings from them? Well, I told you what the answer to that is. So the basic quantities will be correlation functions uh, as I said uh, these are things that are important for everything so in the specific case I'm talking about here about uh, scattering um, at an, uh, something like CERN so for particle scattering we'll see there's uh, there's a relation to scattering amplitudes. Okay, we'll do this later on in the course. But there's a well-defined relation between correlation amplitudes, correlation functions, and scattering amplitudes. Um, but then these are by themselves interesting in, say, condensed matter or cosmology where these are really uh, the objects that you want to calculate which define correlation either in your material or uh, in, in the sky, in the case of cosmology for some relevant uh, quantities that are defined as functions of the fields right? So the basic quantities then are things like the correlation functions, as we said, with these things. So time ordered products of the fields evaluated in the vacuum. But now I emphasize before we're talking about the free field, but now we're talking about the interaction field. This should be in the vacuum of the interacting theory. And this is the Heisenberg field. of the full theory and the others T, X1, X, and all the generalization but 
for starters, we'll, we'll look at this and then we'll see if it generalizes easily. Okay, so these are the, the basic quantities. However, as I said, we want to relate to, first of all, the interaction picture fields and then the vacuum uh, of the free theory in order to do perturbation theory. Okay, so first of all, this interaction picture field is defined at some time t in position x. But then this has to be related to the Heisenberg field in here. Remember, for the Heisenberg field I, I wrote without any indices. But as before, we said at time t0, we define all the features to be equal. So this is, um, this is uh, related to phi at t0 and x. And uh, the relation is for the interaction picture. So this is the same as phi i at t0x. Right? And then this is just time evolution, right? And this is an operator which is evolved according to the free Hamiltonian. So this is just e to the i h t minus t zero e to the minus i h t minus t zero. Okay, that's the time evolution. Um, uh, sorry, h zero. Excuse me, the most important part. <laughs> so it's time evolution according to uh, h zero, the free Hamiltonian. Okay. But now you notice what I did here. Now, this is the Heisenberg field. And then I evolved it with H0. Right? So for this, I did the, the quantization, the regular kind of quantization that we already uh, learned. And then I evolved it with, with H0, which again corresponds to the quantization we did before. So, so I can say that it is this interaction picture field that's quantized like we did before. The only thing I have to remember is that here, in this time evolution in here, I have just the time evolution from t0 to t. So x0 is t minus t0. And then, as usual, t0 is et. Right? Okay, so this is um, yeah. So this relation, this time evolution, which implied this, um, came from well, I erased it, but I had written I had written this right. The AI was equal to AI A zero, right? But this is the same as saying that uh, AI of t is e to the i h0, t minus t0, AI of t0, e minus i h t minus t0, right? So this is the exponential form, the, the um, of the local form written here. So this relation can be obtained by differentiating this, for instance. Right. Okay. All right. So 
so this relation, remember, this was about the time evolution of the field phi. That's how we derived it. You can go, go through the, the equation we did. We did the time evolution of the field phi, right? And then we quantized, I mean, we just expanded in some Fourier modes. So the, the, the space-time part, that was kind of a definition. But the time part corresponded to the evolution. And the evolution is now with h0, OK? So it's really uh, evolution in t minus t0 with p0 being dp, right? This was this fact was from uh, you obtain that e squared is p squared plus m squared, right? Which was the statement of just the uh, klein gordon equation, right? That came from um, so from the free Hamiltonian. So, so h zero gave the klein gordon equation, right? Which was uh, d squared minus n squared phi uh, equal to zero, and from this we obtained this relation, right? You can you can go again through the derivation if you feel uncomfortable about it. And from now on, I'll focus on uh, lambda phi four theory in four dimensions. Uh, simply because it's, uh, for a scalar field, is the simplest kind of interaction. Um, why is that? Well, so we'll, we'll describe this in more detail later, later on, but let me just say, so if we're talking about an interaction, we said phi squared was the quadratic piece, the free piece. So then what can you have? Well, the next terms, you have to have integer powers. Otherwise, you, if you talk about non-integer powers, you, you, uh, you create singularities at phi equals 0. Um, but then phi cubed, this is a potential, right? And phi cubed can be either positive or negative, so it can get infinitely um, negative. So this is taken oftentimes, and we'll also consider it as a toy model, but physically it's not interesting. And so the next one, interesting one, is this. And if you talk about higher order things, we'll see these have dimensions. So these are what's called non renormalizable So really, the, the most interesting thing in four dimensions is lambda phi 4. So let's actually Perhaps it's a good exercise to do at this time to, to convince ourselves that its coupling is dimensionless. So, <clears throat> so let's see how to calculate dimension. Well, the action is dimensionless because it appears in the exponent e to the is. So it has to have dimension 0. Then remember, with h bar and c equal 1, space and time, they're all the same. Um, yeah, so normally here would be s over h bar, but h bar is 1, right? Um, so space and time is the same. So d3 x dt, the dimension of this, this is the fourth power of some, of some length. So the dimension of this is minus 4. Then derivative is the inverse, right? It's 1 over dx. So this is plus 1. So in here, I have minus 4. And the derivatives give me minus 2. So let's write it like this. Minus 4 plus 2 plus 2 times the dimension of phi is 0, right? Which means that the dimension of phi is 1, OK? But then the dimension of phi 4 is 4. So I already have the necessary 4 to answer the minus 4 in here. 
that means that the dimension of lambda is zero. Okay? So lambda is dimensionless, and that's at the basis of this simplification. All right, so so this is for a free scalar field, and H one is this lambda by four. Um, so I guess there's a somewhat a matter of definition. How do you define the lambda? Um, we will see that. It's a useful definition to divide by a four factorial. Um, the, uh, the perturbation theory written this way is uh, slightly simpler. Okay, so I said we want to define something called the Feynman theorem that relates uh, the Heisenberg field and vacuum with the Dirac picture field and vacuum. So let's do this. Let's consider, we'll consider the evolution operator, and from it we'll do, define the Feynman theorem. <clears throat> well, so what when I say um, when I say evolution operator, I of course mean the operator for the uh, interaction picture. So the interaction picture operator, which is written this way. So, uh, so this means what? This means that it relates, it relates the interaction picture state at some time t with the interaction picture state at time t zero. So u i t t zero psi i t zero. And for comparison, we had. Uh, this so in the Schrodinger picture we have a similar formula and remember t0 is defined as the time where uh, the interaction picture is the same as Schrodinger and Heisenberg okay okay then I wrote for you that the interaction picture field. Yeah. Uh, why do you need to have two, uh, two exponentials there? Because aren't we just evolving the state? Well, state we'll see why. We'll see shortly why. But the point is, the point is, this one was a single exponential in some sense, right? This was uh, e to the i h t, right? This was. I mean, the time evolution was given by the Hamiltonian H, right? Specifically, so writing this meant that I had uh, EI dt psi was equal to the Hamiltonian um, acting on uh, CS, uh, CS of t, right? So the time evolution in UI was given by the Hamiltonian H. However, we know that now in the uh, interaction picture, in the interaction picture, I don't have time evolution with H. I have only time evolution with HI. Right? So somehow this has to be equivalent with an e to the h i h i but it's not quite that it's actually the product of like so we'll we'll uh, derive this more precisely now okay 
Uh, so I was saying, the relation between the interaction feature field and the Heisenberg field was given here, was a relation with H0. Uh, but then, but then uh, I can rewrite this. So this operator is at time t0. But I, I can relate the operator at time t0 with the operator at time t, right? By acting inversely with h, right? So the time evolution of the Heisenberg operator with, is with the full Hamiltonian h. And this is at time t0, which is before t, so I act backwards in time from t to t0 with h, right? So I write then that phi i of t and x is, so I write first this operator, t i h0, t minus t0, and let me write it here. And here in the middle, I would write uh, phi Heisenberg at uh, t zero x. Just that I want to rewrite this in terms of phi t Heisenberg at t x. And in order to do so, I have to act backwards in time with h. Um, sorry, I think I have, yeah, I should have, uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I, I think I did a mistake. I was actually wondering, yeah, this is I dagger. U dagger, which means U is uh, e to the i h t minus t0, e minus i h0, t minus t0. The point is, I want this to be U dagger t minus t0. I'm sorry? Can they no, that's why I put the order opposite. When you, when oh, you write dagger. Uh, but but for, uh, for, for a state, uh, when I do the forward uh, time evolution, I, I have the minus sign, right? I'm sorry? Uh, when I do the forward time evolution on a state, I have the minus sign of the exponential, right? It's e to the minus i h t. I don't, I, I don't know if. That's better. Uh, because if that's the case, uh, shouldn't uh, the signs of the exponential, exponentials there be uh, interchanged? Yeah. Uh, no, wait. What? Uh, No. Um, no, this is like this. Why? What? What's the question? Uh, I thought I thought that the signs of the exponentials on that equation should be interchanged because uh, if I do the forward time evolution on a state with a, with a minus sign. No, but I, that's my point. That I have minus e to the i h t minus t zero on psi, and then uh, this should be equivalent to, so this cancels with this, and then that's equivalent to the action on phi. Right? Um, all right. So the point is that then I get uh, I get u uh, 
you acting on um, UI acting from the right, and then U dagger I uh, acting from the left. So this relates now. Um, um, no wait, what am I saying? No. Uh, yeah, I'm getting myself confused with this signs. I thought I had it right in my notes because I, I did this several times. But uh, I'm going to try it. Sorry, I take it back. I, it has to be. No, it has to be the way I defined it. It has to be the way I defined it. Because afterwards I use this equation exactly in this form, and then um, and then I get the right result. UI is yeah. So this is correct. this is correct, then uh, this is correct. U dagger is I then dagger I is five. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, I think yeah, I think it's actually correct. Uh, let me <laughs> Let me assume it was, let, let me keep it as it was originally and then we'll see if we get things right or not. Um, so if this is like this, um, then indeed in here we have now ui t t0, it's exactly this ui on the left, and on the right we have the dagger of that, right? We have first e to the plus ih and then e minus i h0. Okay? And so, so it means phi i is u i phi h u i dagger. That means that phi h uh, is u i uh, dagger phi i u i. Right? So, let's write that. So, phi Heisenberg of P and X is U dagger P I T P zero. Phi I of T and X. U i t p zero. 
right? So I had phi i is u i i h u i dagger, and then I act with u i dagger from the left and u i from the right. This is unitary, so u dagger u is one, and then we get that phi h is u i dagger phi i u i. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's now see that we have the following differential equation, which was really the definition that we were uh, hoping for. Remember that the time evolution of uh, operators is with uh, H1. Sorry, no, the time evolution of, uh, of states is with H1, and UI is supposed to represent that time evolution acting on a fixed state. Right? So let's prove this. Uh, so let's let's just act with i h bar d t on u i, which was defined as e to the i h naught t minus t zero e to the minus i h t minus t zero, right? <coughs> uh, so when I take the time derivative on an exponential, I get down in uh, H naught, right? Um, but since H naught commutes with itself, and H commutes with itself, it I can put so I d t e to the i H naught t is minus H naught e to the i H naught t, but I can put H naught on either side, right? Because this commutes with the exponential, which is also very not. And then uh, i dt e to minus i h t is again now it's with plus e minus i h t. And again I can put h on either side because h commutes with itself so, and the exponential only involves itself. So I can put it on either side. Um, and I want to choose to put both of them such that they are in the middle. So I obtain, uh, uh, I obtain here then h minus h naught, right? So this is equal to um, e i h naught t minus t zero h minus h naught. E minus i h t minus t zero. Okay. And this is h one, right? Just that h and h naught are in the Schrodinger or Heisenberg picture. So h one is also in the Heisenberg picture, right? But then in the interaction picture, this is evolved with H naught, like here. So H1 Schrodinger e minus i H naught e minus t naught, right? Evolved with H naught. The operators are operators. Evolved with um, with H naught. Okay. So I can rewrite this. Um, So I introduce 
oscillating in here e minus i h naught t minus t naught times e plus i h naught t minus t naught right and then I form this quantity which as you see is h1 um, i okay and finally then I get that e h bar dt u hat i t t naught is h1 i then uh, acting on this combination which you see was the original um, was the original UI okay this is H1I times UI T0 okay so we've proven what we wanted that indeed this equation holds and now I can a posteriori justify the um, the form of the evolution operator because what I want of the evolution operator is exactly this that its time evolution is the time evolution of states right? because when acting on some fixed state I want to obtain that corresponding time evolution okay? all right No, when I uh, every time I got confused at this minus signs, every time I go through this derivation, so uh, I'm glad that now it's actually fixed. Um, all right. So the object that appears in uh, the time evolution operator, this H1i, is this, right? And this will be what will appear in our perturbation theory. H naught t minus t naught. And then uh, H1 Schrodinger t minus H naught t minus t naught. <clears throat> but then this was lambda phi Heisenberg for integral, right? Uh, but uh, so, sorry, phi is rather right. But uh, now I evolved it with the free Hamiltonian h naught, so e to the i h naught times phi plus in minus i h naught. Now, of course, this is phi four, but you know, if I write this. You see that all of these things form the interaction picture operator, right? And so on. I could I could have any power here if the result is the same. So the point is that this is phi i to the four. Okay? So this is good, means that. I can only deal with interaction picture uh, fields and operators. I don't need to mix them. Okay, so this definition is equivalent with this definition, as we've shown. And this is what we expect from the evolution operator in the interaction picture. However, um, 
I want to solve the differential equation, not for this, because I can't work with this. I want to solve something in terms of this hi, right? Something like e to the minus i hi, h1i t, something like this, right? That would be the goal, because then I would be able to uh, work only with interaction picture operators and expand um, in this lambda. But of course, it's not so easy, otherwise I would have done it directly in here. The point is, there is uh, issues of ordering to be considered, right? So let's do this uh, more rigorously. So, solution of differential equation. Uh, so, let's, let's use it. Uh, so, we know it has to be something like this exponential. So, let's think of it as a, a sum over uh, increasing powers. And see how far we can get. Well, certainly the one is there. And also, certainly, the first order term is there, just like min of minus i h. So, this is uh, minus i integral dt h. Actually, let me write from now on like this, since I wrote this in the notes. Uh, and I'll write the uh, variable t1. Okay, so this is this is certainly there. <clears throat> and then uh, naively, I should write the square of the. Um, Naively, I should write the square of this term, so minus i squared over 2 factorial, and then I should write perhaps something like this. Okay? But you see the problem, right? The problem is these are fields that act, these are um, in terms of fields at different times, right? And so these Hamiltonian at different times they're different operators, right? Which therefore a priori don't commute. So I have a question about ordering. Okay. So I have a question about ordering. But except for this question about ordering, we can see that this, um, this uh, works out. If I call this zero order term, this first order term, and this second order term, I can see that i uh, dt times the first order term is hii times the zeroth order term, right? The time derivative just kills the integral, and then i kills the minus i, and I'm left with i hi times 1. And similarly, i dt times the second order term is hii times the first order term. And that's kind of clear because we know the solution is something like an exponential, and I wrote modulo issues of ordering I wrote basically the exponential. Okay? So this general structure is okay. The only issue I have to consider is the ordering issue.
Um, uh, sorry. There's still a, an issue of Um, yeah, it shouldn't be a two factorial here. Why shouldn't it be? Oh, naively there should be. So if I if I take um, if I take the time derivative with respect respect to t. I would get two terms, right? I would get. Seven integral to t1. No, no, that's what I will do next. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. You're, for the moment, I just wrote as if it's e to the minus i integral h dt, right? And then I just wrote the quadratic piece in here. Um, so naively it should be over 2 factorial, right? Because I can either act here or here. Uh, and then I have to divide by 2 to get just one term. Yeah, sorry. No, that's right. So I, I want to. Okay. Yeah, so I could write one over two factorial. First. Yeah. No, no, that's <laughs> the same thing he has. Just wait. As I said, I, I was just writing this, I was just writing e to minus i integral h dt. The quadratic piece, I mean, I wrote it like this, but really it's the same thing squared, right? That's what I wrote here. I, I wrote the perfect square. Okay? Um, but indeed, uh, instead of writing 1 over 2 factorial times the integral, um, so if I write this as t1, t2, and then t0, Okay. Um, so what I uh, what I have in here with one over two factorial um, with one over two factorial is is the integral over the whole square, right? So I have integral from t0 to t in both directions. But I want to replace with just integral over um, uh, to integral over just one triangle, right? So um, one over two 
integral of a box then is equal to integral over the triangle, right? And that's the way I want to think about it. Um, just that um, there's an issue of time ordering that I had to consider, right? I want it so that I will only act once and then the, uh, on the one that is on the left so that when I, when I act with the time derivative I get something, I get hi on the left, right? So that means I want that the time t on the left uh, to be larger than the time t0 on the right, which means I need time ordering. I want, I want t greater than t0. So if I, uh, no, t1, t2, uh, t1 greater than t2. Right? So if I do this, then when I uh, differentiate with respect to t, I always differentiate uh, the term on the left, and therefore I get an h on the left in the differential equation. Right? So if I do that, that means that the result I have in here can be rewritten as Um, so, I write the same thing, the same 1 over 2 factorial, because I want to keep the same integral in here, so minus i squared over 2 factorial, the same dt1 from t0 to t, the same dt2 from t0 to t, but now I write a, uh, I write time order product of hii t1 hii t2. Okay? And if I do this, then I'm guaranteed to solve that equation because always when I differentiate, I differentiate with respect to the larger t, I differentiate with respect to this t, but this is always the one that's to the left. Okay? So I always obtain h i to the left of all the other terms. Okay? But now I can uh, I understand how to uh, sum this uh, all these terms. I really get an integral. It's just a time ordered. Uh, I really get an exponential. It's just a time ordered exponential. So the solution, the final solution here. is that so the solution is that ui of t t0 is the time order exponential about this being outside is that the time ordering it's always of the product. So here I have two h's at the next order I'll have three h's but always the time ordering will be outside of the h's, right? So time ordering is outside the exponential. Is that clear? So if you have change notation choose this zero i yeah yeah sorry I, I, it's just I keep looking at my notes and it's I put H I in my notes and then uh, it's hard if I don't uh, follow this. Sorry for this. Yeah, which one I if you want. But. All right. So we have an expression of the time evolution operator as a kind of exponential and only in terms of H I I, which was written only in terms of interacting with the fields. So that's good. 
but we still need the next step to relate this and the vacuum of, to, to relate uh, uh, the correlation functions with the vacuum of the full theory and the correlation functions with the vacuum of the um, pertur perturbed theory. So in order to do this, we will prove the Feynman theorem. So we want to relate roughly speaking uh, h and omega to a0 and 0. <coughs> so to do this we'll start from uh, the statement that the energy of the vacuum of the full theory is the Hamiltonian evaluated in the state omega. And then, besides this state omega, we also have states n of energies Em that are greater than E0. Okay? So that's on this side. Now, on this side, we have a state 0, such that a0 is 0, is 0, right? The, for the quadratic piece, we know that the um, vacuum of the free theory gives 0. And for the full theory, the vacuum and the excited states form a complete set. That's our definition. That we found all the states that are eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian, uh, that are eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian. And uh, therefore, we should be able to write a completeness relation so in the Fox space of the full theory, in the Hilbert space, I should say, of the full theory. The states omega and m are complete. Which means I can write the identity as omega omega plus sum of m and m. Right? That's, uh, well, n different than 0, of course. Non-vacuum. But then I want to consider this quantity e to the i h, where h is the full Hamiltonian t, acting on the state uh, 0 of the free theory. So the vacuum of the free theory. And I want to insert this 1 in here. Right? And then the first term is omega omega. But omega, so I have e to the i h t acting on this vacuum state omega, so that would give me e zero, right? So the first term coming from here will be e to the i e zero t um, omega omega zero, and then uh, for these other states, the same reasoning will give us Em, right? Sum over m different from 0, e, e m, t, uh, m, and 0. OK?
Okay, then let's consider time going to infinity. Just that I will consider a modified infinity with 1 minus i epsilon. So a slightly complex time. The point is that we have, we have these exponentials and we want to dampen them. Right? So I take a regularization. This is a regularization of an infinite sum. Mm. Um, sorry, uh, yeah, actually, I wanted to deal with the minus. Um, but the point is now, I, if I have e to the i, uh, e minus i, e and t, this is e uh, minus i infinity times em. That's kind of oscillating, but then also e minus i times minus i is minus epsilon e m infinity, right? And then this goes to zero. Okay? But, moreover, what I'm interested in is also the comparison of these two terms. And this is formally like this, and both go to zero. It's just that En is greater than E0 by definition, which means this goes fast to zero faster than this. It means uh, E minus um, uh, E0 infinity epsilon is much greater than E minus epsilon En infinity. So the point is that this regularization kills all of the higher order terms and leaves only the first one. Uh, I'm left with E0 only. Okay. Okay, so let's then define. So remember, our goal was some relation between omega, well, between omega and zero, perhaps involving h and h naught, right? So I want to write this vacuum zero, uh, this vacuum omega. Uh, With the regularization, I can say that I got rid of all these terms. Okay? And so this what remains is a relation between two things. But see here on the left, on the right, we have this piece that's just a number, right? So I can just divide by it. So divide by e minus i e zero t omega zero and then in here I'll just get omega which is what I want to obtain and moreover I have to remember that this is really a limit so the limit has to be put outside t going to infinity one minus i epsilon and now we have what e minus i h t acting, or I want to put, well, t plus t zero. I mean, it doesn't really matter, but uh, I want to define an extra t zero. And here, in the numerator, I have e minus uh, i e zero t plus t zero, and then this product, omega zero. Okay? 
And now, um, I remember that H0 acting on 0 is 0, right? So that means that I can invent, so I can write that 0 is equal to E I H, for instance, T plus T0, 0, because all the higher order terms cancel like this. So I, therefore, I can put for sorry a zero. I can put for free such exponential in the, in the uh, numerator and obtain that this is e minus i h t plus t zero e plus i h t plus t zero zero. And then uh, e minus i t zero t plus t zero uh, omega zero. And this thing is nothing but the uh, interaction picture operator, right? This is u i of so the sine of t zero is correct. So, uh, But for the interaction picture operator, I have, sorry, um, A0, right? So this is, in fact, um, interaction picture operator T0 demands me. So let's, let's do this more precisely so there's no confusion. So we had, um, Let me write it like this and then specialize this to see. So this was equal to e to the i h0 uh, e1 minus t2. Uh, sorry, this was um, no, it was um, yeah, with this sign, okay, minus i h t1 minus t2, right? Um, and so, if I put uh, Or no, maybe let me write it like this. T zero. Um, but then U i of T zero and minus T is first of all I have to take the dagger of this. So finally, the omega is limit t going to infinity 1 minus i epsilon, ui of t0 uh, minus t0 over e minus i t0 t plus t0 omega 0. Okay? <clears throat> and then similarly, I can obtain the opposite, the, the bra, 
from the cat. Uh, zero u i zero over minus zero t minus t zero zero omega. Okay. But um, the, the, the reason I wrote this is because now I want to relate the two-point function in the full theory to the two-point function in perturbation theory. The two-point function in the full theory point function in the full theory was omega phi of x phi of y omega. Actually it was with a time order, uh, with time ordering, but for the moment let's consider it like this. And then the point is it's still time order, but I want to consider um, the case where x0 is greater than y0 and moreover is greater than t0. <coughs> so, this is then what? This is limit t goes to infinity minus 1 minus uh, i epsilon. And then I can put only 1 because uh, 1 such limit because uh, t I can choose to be the same for both. Uh, of the two states. And now I replace both for the bra and for the cat uh, with these formulas. So 0 ui t t0 over e minus t0 t minus t0 0 omega. Uh, Um, sorry. Um, and now I have this phi and times phi, and for phi we have written the relation to. So we had written that phi. We have calculated phi of here. X is equal to u dagger i t t zero uh, phi i t x u i t t zero. We've calculated this before, so now I want to uh, replace phi of x with that. So u i dagger u um, i dagger of um, so phi in here contain x zero as time x zero and then this was related with t zero and here phi i uh, yeah phi i of x the same thing and on the right we have u i the time t is the same as 0 when t0. Then the same thing for, for phi of y. So u i dagger y0 zero, t0 zero, phi i of y u i y0 zero, t0. Zero. And now finally omega, the, the cat state, the limit we already put. So Put just uh, ui t0 minus t0 over e minus i e0 t plus t0 omega 0. All right. And now, 
let's cancel some of these uh, uh, some of these terms. So uh, first of all, you know you dagger t1 t2 is u t2 t1, and uh, so here. Um, how do I want to write it? Yeah. So here I have u i x zero t zero, and then this is then u i t zero y zero. So that means together the product takes us from x zero to t zero, then t zero to y zero. So all in all, this is all in all this is u uh, i x0, y0. <coughs> uh, then what else? Then this with this. This with this. Uh, yeah, this is already of this type. So it's from y0 to t0, then t0 to minus t0. So this one is ui, y0 to minus t. And then this times this. This is ui of t0, x0. And then this takes us from t to t0, from t0 to x0. So this one gives ui t, x0. Okay? So we get that omega phi omega is equal to limit t going to infinity 1 minus i epsilon 0 uh, ui uh, ui t x 0 uh, then phi i of x then uh, ui of x0, y0, then phi l of y, and then ui of x0, uh, ui of y0 minus t. And 0. And the numerator is uh, want to write it together. So <coughs> it's a product of this with this. And then here I have e to the minus i is sorry plus i e0 t0 and e to the minus i e0 t0. So those cancel. And I'm left with e minus i t e0 t and here also e minus i e0 t. So e to the minus 2 i e0 t and 0 omega and omega 0, that's absolute value squared of omega 0, right? <clears throat> um, on the other hand, uh, we obtained two expressions for the same thing, right? So, we obtained Excuse me. An expression for the omega prime, but an expression for the omega cat. And multiplying them, since the states are assumed to be orthonormal, we should get 1. So 1 is supposed to be equal to omega omega, and is the product of the two. So uh, limit t going to infinity 1 minus i epsilon. Uh, 0 u i of t t0 over uh, e minus i e0 t minus t0 0 omega and then the the ket was u i t0 minus t 0 and then e 
minus i t0 t plus t0 omega 0. So here we again cancel the t zeros, right? So in the denominator we get the same denominator e minus 2 i e0 t uh, omega 0 into the value squared and uh, in here we go from t to t0 and t0 to minus t so this is ui t minus t so 1 is equal to limit t going to infinity 1 minus i epsilon 0 ui t minus t 0 over e minus 2i 0 t omega 0 squared okay uh, so now you know you can divide the two relations or another way of saying it under the limit of t going to infinity minus i epsilon I can just replace this denominator by this numerator right so finally I obtain finally I obtain that my two point function is equal to the limit going to infinity one minus i epsilon zero ui of t x0 pi i of x uh, ui x0 y0 pi i of y ui y0 minus t 0 divided by so now I have replaced the Denominator this ui t minus t zero. So you see now finally this starts to look nice because now I've written so this is a Heisenberg picture object and it's written only in terms of uh, of uh, interaction picture objects. And moreover, with no uh, reference to any reference time t zero. Um, so, but remember, this was done for x0 greater than y0 greater than t0. And uh, when we did this, we obtained uh, the correct ordering in here. You see, this is time ordering, so t greater than t, x0 greater than y0 greater than minus t. Okay, so all of the times in this expression are time ordered. Um, and, uh, and so I can, I can re replace this by saying, so this is the same as putting time ordering in here, right? I've done nothing, this was already time ordered. But now I can do something. I can uh, peel off, um, no, the other way. Peel off on this side the phi's, right? Inside the time ordering I can put them whatever, because time ordering defines an ordering. And uh, then I'm left with the product ui t x naught ui x naught y naught ui y naught minus t, which is this goes from t to x naught x naught to y naught y naught to minus t. So this is ui of t minus t, right? So this is equal to limit t goes to uh, infinity 1 minus i epsilon 0 time order product of 5x 5y 
u i to minus t zero over zero u i to minus t zero. Okay. Uh, and then, moreover, I have this expression for u i of t minus t, which I've calculated. The expression is uh, time order exponential. But the time order is already there, so I don't need to put it again. So I just replace this with uh, e to the minus sign integral minus t t uh, dt h1 uh, h i of t, right? Both here and here. Okay. It was a time ordering up in here, but I already have time ordering, so I don't need to. So in the end, this is limit zero time order product phi of x phi of y e minus i integral minus t t dt i one i t zero over the same thing but without the phi's. So, 
we've defined the Feynman theorem, which defines our perturbation theorem. But in order to be able to calculate, we need one more theorem, and that's the big theorem. But, uh, so the point is, we've reduced things to calculating these uh, time order products with, uh, well, let's say, with phi's, phi i's, right, in the vacuum of the, um, um, of the three years. Now we need to calculate things like this. That's our uh, question. And so, by the way, also this exponential, you must always lambda phi i to the 4 or 4 phi plural, so this still gives a bunch of phi's, the same thing. So, really, we've reduced the calculation of our correlator to the calculation of things like that. Right. So, how do we do this? Well, the point is, we need to split this into two pieces that will be defined as phi plus and phi minus, where plus and minus stand for positive or negative frequencies. That is to say, remember, phi is, phi is the sum of an exponential plus IPX and one minus IPX. So this phi plus then is the plus IPX. And phi minus is the other one. Right? Since phi plus has days and phi minus has a dagger, so it's important to not get confused about this. This is plus and minus, but it's not dagger, right? So phi minus has the daggers. Uh, it means that phi plus on the vacuum is zero, and correspondingly the vacuum is phi minus is zero, right? And now Um, normal ordering we defined before as putting a daggers to the left and a to the right. Now I'll denote it by n simply because, well, it will, uh, um, it's more commonly known in, in this uh, formula, in this fixed theorem. So now that means uh, phi plus, oh, sorry, phi minus to the left plus this has a daggers this has a's so let's see if I have x not greater than y not Plus 
plus minus, that's in the wrong order, right? Because this has a, this has a dagger. So I'll write phi minus of y by plus of x plus the commutator phi i plus of x phi minus phi of y. And then finally, phi i minus x phi i plus of y is in the right order. Okay? And this thing, as I said, I, I defined it this way. This is normal order. So this is equal to n of phi of x phi of y. Okay? So we see that at least in this uh, two-point product, temporal ordering is equal to normal ordering plus commutator of the plus commutator of plus parts with minus parts. And then if y naught is greater than y naught, change x with y, right? <clears throat> now we define the so-called contraction. On the other hand, what's this contraction? Well, this commutator is a C number, right? Phi plus has A and phi minus has A daggers. So this is then equal to the commutator between, uh, between vacuum. Right? That's an identity for any C number. Um, but now, if I write this, this is phi plus phi minus minus phi minus phi plus. And in this, phi plus has, um, has A only, so acting on 0 gives 0. So this is equal to 0 phi plus phi minus 0. Right? But this is what? This is just the propagator D that we defined, right? This was our definition for the propagator D. So it follows, uh, and with a correct uh, time ordering as well. So it means that this contraction is not a new thing. What is this? Y. But I get 1D if x naught is greater than y naught, and if x naught is less than y naught, I get uh, the one with x and y interchange. So specifically, the propagator that I get is the final propagator. Alright, 
So now we also see why the Feynman propagator is the one that uh, is relevant to perturbation theory and which Feynman introduced. Because in the Feynman theorem, all we get are these products. And now we've seen that uh, T of phi i x phi i y is equal to m phi i x phi i y plus the final propagator. Right? So in the expansion, in here we get the final propagator. But moreover,
this big theorem in between 0 and 0, the thing that I want to calculate, this big theorem says that only I have only fully contracted terms. Okay? Nothing else contributes. This gives only fully contracted terms. In other words, only products of propagators, of the Feynman propagators. Right? That's, that's the, the, uh, the message of all this. So, let's consider to see an example, let's consider the simplest non-trivial example, which is the four-point function. So the four-point function comes with this term to me. I'm just lazy. I, I write a bunch of terms. I will not write index i, index 1, and so on. Just write y1, and y2. It's clear what I mean. So this is what? This is, well, first of all, the fully normal order product, right? And then uh, a bunch of other terms. So I have these non-fully ordered things. Non-fully non contracted terms.
in induction. And then, as an exercise for you, I left to prove that step n implies step n plus 1. That's everything I wanted to tell you today. Uh, do you have uh, questions? All right. If not, uh, let me. So, so I I brought the uh, exercises from last week. Corrected. I'm still missing a few people, but I have to. I mean, every Monday I will have to uh, tell, tell you how to um, solve the other one, so, you know, I will only accept uh, if you have, uh, you know, back things not, not, uh, not uh, give me, then, then I'll just accept them now, not later, because I'll already show how to solve them. Um, so, uh, so, for the lecture 2, I want to... Yeah, maybe you should.